to compare a lump sum tax to a specific tax, we need to first specify that the government's revenue for these two choices should be the same. Two classes of people get affected by tax, the government and the people who are taxed. If we were comparing a tiny lump sum tax with a huge specific tax, that really wouldn't make a lot of sense because what we're looking at is how these two influence the person who's taxed. That's the consumer whose indifference curves we're drawing and whose budget constraint we're drawing. And if the specific tax is huge, then of course the consumer's worse off. It's, uh, it, it would be trivial to compare these two taxes if one of them was gigantic and the other was extremely small. In order for this question to make sense, what we want to do is impose the condition that the government collects the same amount of revenue for both of these taxes. So that the so that both these taxes assumption raise equal tax revenue. So in this way, the government doesn't care whether it imposes the lump sum tax or the specific tax. The government's completely indifferent because it raises, they're going to raise the same revenue. And the question we're going to ask is, does the consumer care? And you might think the answer is, well, no. If, you're going to be, if the government's going to be raising 20 bucks, what difference does it make to how the government raises it? So that's what's really interesting about this lump sum principle, is that it shows that that's actually incorrect intuition. It does matter to the consumer how the government raises it, even though the government's going to raise $20 no matter what. So that's the essence of the insight that this mechanism, that this theory, that this model gives. All right. So the setup we had before was BC1 was the original budget constraint. It was a no tax budget constraint. BC2 was a specific tax budget constraint. And we assumed that there was some optimal point on BC2 <coughs> characterized by X2 and Y2. So the specific tax is BC2. The lump sum tax is going to be BC3. The budget constraint for the lump sum tax is going to be BC3. And the question is, where is BC3 going to be drawn? Now, one thing we already know is that BC3 is parallel to BC1. And that's because, well, let's work out the math. The, the, the budget constraint under the lump sum taxes, income equals expenditures. Expenditures are PXX plus PYY plus the lump sum tax. Income is I. So you'll recall from last time that the mathematical formula for a lump sum tax is just T. So if you solve this equation for Y, again, I'll do it uh, a little bit quickly. We have PYY equals minus PXX minus t plus i, and so y is minus px over py times x minus t over py plus i over py. So this has the form y equals mx plus b, where that's m, that's x, and this whole part now is b. So what happens here, and, and the reason it's B is because there aren't any X's in it. The re the, so what happens here is that the budget constraint has the same slope as before, minus PX over PY, but it has a different Y-intercept. Of course, it's got a smaller Y-intercept because the person has to pay a tax. It might even be easier to see this algebraically if I write it in one other way y equals minus px over py times x plus i 
minus t divided by py. So here you can see the, the difference between what we had before. Before we just had an i over py, and now we have i minus t over py. So the lump sum tax functions as a decrease in income. And therefore, BC, as we said over here, BC3 is going to be parallel to BC1, and it's going to correspond to a smaller affordable set. So it's like taking BC1 and pushing it towards the origin, pushing it down and to the left. The question we need to ask is, exactly where is BC3? And I'm going to claim the following. BC3 passes through the point x2, y2. I'm going to prove this claim in the next lesson. The point I want to make here, but before we start that, is once I prove it, I'll know exactly where BC3 is. I already discussed that BC3 is parallel to BC1. If I'm successful in claiming here that BC3 passes through x2, y2, then I know a point that BC3 passes th through, so BC3 would pass through x2, y2. And I also know its slope because it's parallel to BC1. So I would know then that, that BC3 was a new budget constraint which was parallel to BC1 so you take BC1 and you push it towards the origin until it passes through x2, y2 and that would be something like something like that now we'll do it more precisely later on but the point is if I manage to prove this claim that BC3 passes through x2, y2 then I will have exactly determined where BC3 is given the basic assumption that the lump sum tax and the specific tax that I'm interested in raise equal revenue. I'm not saying that lump sum tax and specific taxes always raise equal revenue. I'm saying that the particular situation that I'm interested in analyzing is one where the government is going to impose either a lump sum tax or a specific tax, but the government's going to arrange things so that it doesn't care because it's going to raise equal revenue. And it wants to know, well, if the government doesn't care, does Anybody, is anybody else going to care? The answer is going to be yes. We'll see how. But in order to do that, we need to uh, we need to prove this claim. By the way, I should say that the the graph I I, I just drew with this budget constraint this isn't exactly uh, drawn quite right, and I'll draw it. It's not drawn quite right because the um, the budget constraint the the geometry right at b x two uh, y2 is a little different than what it appears. I will draw that much more carefully in the next lesson or the one after that.